So now I'm mostly seeing votes for C that Pluto does not dominate its orbit. We do know that it does orbit the sun and it's obviously approximately spherical, um, but it doesn't dominate its orbit. So the main culprit here is its moon Charon, which is extremely large. Um, and so that's, you know, one piece of, I guess, large mass that Pluto has not successfully gathered up. Um, okay, so Pluto is classified as a dwarf planet. So let's go ahead and dig in a little bit more on what it's like. So here is what I mean by Pluto and Charon are very similar in size. Um, Pluto is 2,400 kilometer diameter and Charon is about half that size, 1,200 kilometer. And so here they are compared to the Earth for comparison. And they are in a double tidal lock. So remember tidal locking happens when an object that's slightly um, elongated due to tidal forces from its parent, um, that, that um, you know, the direction that that bulge points can change. It can point directly at the parent planet, but it could also point away from it. And if that happens, then over time, the planet will pull that uh, bulge back toward it or forward toward it. And um, the friction involved will slow down the planet until it eventually becomes tidally locked. So it's in perfect uh, step where one face always faces the planet. So our moon is tidally locked, but the earth is not tidally locked to the moon, right? The, uh, the moon still orbits and every, everyone on earth can eventually see the moon. Uh, but for Pluto, it's different. Pluto faces Charon with the same face and Charon faces Pluto with its same face. So uh, I guess if they were holding hands in space, they could keep holding hands forever. Um, and it also means that if you, you know, lived on the wrong side of Pluto, you would never see the moon, which would be a little strange. Okay, so uh, what's going on on the surface of Pluto? This is an image that we obtained from the New Horizons spacecraft. And the, the uh, color here is a little bit exaggerated so you can kind of make out the details. Uh, but the first thing that we noticed from New Horizons is there's kind of a heart-shaped uh, white region here. And so that's the heart on Pluto. And we call that the Tomba Regio. It's named after Clyde Tomba, the discoverer of Pluto. And um, the other thing to notice here is just the, the vast difference in sort of the color and texture of these different regions. So there's this um, reddish region that's relatively smooth, but it does have large craters. Uh, this white region, which is very smooth, and then a large um, kind of whitish yellowish region that's also cratered. So um, it seems that Pluto has some activity that's causing these different textures. So what's going on here? For the most smooth part of Pluto, uh, this is a nitrogen filled glacial basin. So this is nitrogen ice and it moves around over time because in uh, the sunlit times when Pluto is, when that face of Pluto is facing the sun, uh, it becomes just slightly warm enough uh, that nitrogen can go directly from the ice phase to the gas phase. So remember that's sublimation like dry ice does, or like ice cubes in your freezer do. If you leave them in there for too long, they kind of evaporate. So in the sunlight, that nitrogen sublimates, and then um, at nighttime, it condenses again. And so this region can kind of creep over time and kind of flow like a glacier does. Um, Pluto has about a six-day rotation period, so this day-night cycle is relatively quick. Okay. Um, when we look a little bit closer at some of the surface features on Pluto uh, from the New Horizons craft, we find there's these very textured icy mountains and then also these funny kind of polygon shapes that appear to be kind of wavy as, as if they're maybe dunes. So we see icy mountains, we see dunes, and then we also see a very thin atmospheric haze. Um, and this is caused by the uh, nitrogen sublimation. So what do we interpret about these images? Um, we, we notice that the surface of Pluto is relatively uh, less cratered than we might expect. And this kind of makes sense because the Kuiper belt is very less uh, populous uh, than the asteroid belt. And so it wouldn't have been hit by quite as many objects in its history. The mountains that we see turn out to be made of water ice. And so maybe it's more 
uh, descriptive to call them icebergs because they're floating on a sea of liquid nitrogen underneath. And then we see these uh, planes with these kind of dune-like patterns and these cracks. And um, as we saw on other um, moons of Jupiter, the cracks here indicate that there's some, uh, you know, thaw, freeze cycles and shifting going on. So this is how we know that there's this liquid nitrogen subsurface ocean. And when we kind of try to paint the picture of what that interior looks like, this is what um, one of the artists from New Horizons came up with. Uh, Pluto has a silicate core. Above that, there seems to be a liquid water ocean that's pushing up uh, the different parts of the crust. Um, there's a kind of icy crust above that liquid water ocean. And then here there is convecting volatile ices. So this is what I mean by a liquid nitrogen ocean. Parts of this are icy, but parts are also liquid. And then on top we have those geometric polygons, the water ice mountains. And then on top of the crust, we have those uh, more cratered reddish regions. Uh, we don't know why Pluto is red, by the way. Um, it seems like this red color might be from some of the kind of um, sooty particles, kind of, you know, photochemical reactions that cause some of the different ice compounds to form reddish materials that then fall back onto its surface. Uh, but this is really not well understood right now. <laughs> 